Hello, welcome to Claret and Blue. My name is Dan Rowlands, and I'm joined this afternoon on a lovely summer's day by John Townley. Not that you can see it in your background, John. Uh, how are things, mate? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. Very, uh, very hot at the moment, isn't it? We're here today to talk about a QA and a for Aston Villa. Uh, we've got plenty of questions lined up from social media and the Bang On Live Q&A from the, the one you did this morning, John. Uh, before we get into what has been a, a busy couple of days for Aston Villa and the big news of Tielemans joining and Perzo leaving, I wanted to ask you a question first of all. How are you finding the new role, the new job? You couldn't have joined at a busier time, basically. Very tiring. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, yeah, it's going really well. I'm really enjoying it. I've got a bit of lack of sleep. And I said to you earlier, I'm up at 5am tomorrow to go to London to do different things. It is very tiring and there's a lot going on. And yeah, but you wouldn't want it any other way, would you? Like Villa have been very busy at the start of this summer. And <laughs> I said in my Q&A, like tomorrow the transfer window opens, Thursday's fixture release day. So it's mm. going to get no, uh, nothing slowing down. And we're only getting closer to when... Um, Players return for pre-season, start of July next month. So, yeah, June's already going very quickly. So, yeah. It's so we're halfway through June already. It's crazy. Say so 26 degrees outside. A couple of weeks ago, it felt like it was like nine degrees and rain. <laughs> Horrible. So, football changes quickly and so does so does our. <laughs> that, that affects our job. So, yeah. It's nice to be busy. It's nice to be talking about largely positive things for Aston Villa as well. We'll start with the Christian Perzlo news and something we've not spoken about on the podcast since it was announced. Was it yesterday morning, I think? So Perzlo leaves his role after five years as Aston Villa CEO. Can you first of all explain a little bit about why that's come about and, and what that means for the kind of overall restructure, I guess? I think it's important to highlight from the start that it's not a decision that was made due to any sort of disharmony or any clash or whatever in the boardroom because a lot of... A lot of times those sort of big decisions and those big announcements are due to different things, but this one isn't to do with that. Perslo stepped down, stepped down on good terms. He's well respected at Villa and across the Premier League, as we all know, for, for how he operates and how he has held different roles at different clubs, different um, different positions. But the one at Villa that he had, at least at the very start, was very influential being a CEO. But that's now changed somewhat because Villa are restructuring behind the scenes. So his role of a CEO is basically or was affected. And as far as we know, he was offered another opportunity to stay at the club in a different sort of role. But he didn't take that up. So he's left the club. As a result, um, but again, he had no sort of um, disharmony or anything like that. Nothing to do with those sort of dramatic uh I don't know, reactions that people might have thought straight away. It's, that's not the case. It's just the Villa have restructured. His role was affected and whatever other role he was offered at the time, he didn't want to take up and obviously is well within his rights to to leave as a result. So yeah, Villa's restructuring is kind of, we won't go into too much detail, but essentially it's a business side and a football side. Hmm. And, I like that, by the way. Yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll see how it goes. It's I don't know if that's more sort of a modern approach or whether it's something the Villa just think will work better for the stage that they're at. The club have been owned by V Sports now or NSWE for five years, so things are always going to change. And five years is a long time in football. So, yeah, I think the work that Perslow has done overall has been very good for the club. I don't think it's sort of um, a coincidence that we've gone from being in the Championship to to be playing in Europe and I know that's a bit of a stretch to say but or, or at least a, 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 a stable Premier League club who financially are doing yeah. very well considering where they were and I think personal has definitely played a big role behind that and I don't know quite how to word it but we haven't actually seen the sort of fruits of his labour in terms of not all of it yet anyway there's still some things that are going to be coming like Villa Park um, different investments and things that personal has worked on behind the scenes a lot of it we've seen, but some some we're yet to see, which, uh, again, I think is testament to the job that he's performed well in. And again, Suarez and Edens weren't going to appoint anybody. It had to be the right person and yeah. the person with them filled that. And yeah, so for me, he's overall he's done a good job. Yeah, we'll talk about his kind of the timeline of Christian Perslow in a sec. To me, it feels a little bit like it's not like an anti-Christian Perslow thing. It's almost like an anti-CEO thing that that role isn't, just isn't there anymore. It doesn't exist. And I think that, I would need to look into it more. You need to look into yeah, it more. So wherever usual for a Premier League club not to have a CEO. Potentially. So I'm. I'll be honest. I'm not too sure what the Premier League clubs do in terms of their structures, and we're not privy to exactly what Villa are doing. But in terms of the split, it's a obviously Villa appointed Chris Heck or V Sports appointed Chris Heck as the president of business operations. He will be or has or is leading the business side of the football club. 
and then the football side at the moment is run by um, you know Johan Langer, um, Unai Emery. The, the football decision has been made by them, and obviously, uh, again, at, at the time of this call, Villa won to appoint Monchi, but it would be a senior football position. Something that obviously the Villa wanted to um, bring in Matthew Alemani or Alemania to to fulfil. That didn't happen, and Monchi is the candidate that's um, being considered and. Is close to joining. Yeah, let's talk about the, the Purs low timeline then. And I wrote some kind of notes down in front of me for this, and they're very kind of like, does this, does this, does this, does this? So forgive me for that. It's not more detail, but sacks Bruce, appoints Smith, gets promoted, keeps Jack Grealish with a new deal. We stay in the Premier League and sell Jack Grealish with big money. We then sack Dean Smith. The replacements for Grealish probably aren't great. Wendia, Bailey, and Danny Ings, and one of those isn't even here anymore. Hires Gerard, sacks Gerard. Nasef Sawiris effectively appoints Unai Emery and then Christian Perzo leaves. That's how it kind of feels. And there'll be other things in there, like being a a vital part of us handing new deals to Martinez or Douglas Louise and things like that. And, of course, there's the North Stan redevelopment and all those kind of business commercial deals on on the one side, which... That's what he was good for after going from Championship to uh, Europa Conference League. He's like, well done, you know, Emery, because you've done it, had a great six months to get us there. But there's people like Christian Perzo that came before him that laid the foundations for us to be successful now. So, yes, I kind of get that he's done a, a good job and had a good five years and definitely leaves Villa in a better place than he found them in five years ago. Obviously, we were in the Championship when he came. I just can't see past the, the Gerard thing. And that's just me as, as a fan and, and how I see things. You could list off five or six good things there that came before appointing Dean Smith at the right time. We get promoted, keeping hold of Jack Grealish and making 100 million. Yeah, great, good stuff, all that kind of thing. Perslow was the one that kind of nailed his colours to the mass with Gerard, and that was a spectacular failure. And I don't think, and again, this is speculation, I don't think Perslow could have recovered from that. And for Nassef Sawiri to kind of step in to save the day with Una Emery, it kind of felt to me at least that that was the end of Perslow in, in some respects. But I'm, again, like you said, I'm not kind of fueling the fire that there was some kind of fallout because Perslow leaves on amicable terms. Picking up on the point you mentioned about, you know, I mean, I think it's difficult because throughout Villa's last five years, there seems to always been a, a sort of main figure in the success. So mm. when Villa were promoted, you'd look at, I mean, Grealish and possibly Dean Smith, there's one big decision he's got correct. And I think that probably gave him, Suarez had more trust in him to then do the next appointment, which was obviously Gerard, and that backfired, as he has already admitted. But, I mean, when Villa get promoted, then again, you're looking at Grealish and Smith doing well. And I just feel like personally was always sort of secondary or even third to other people in the club at, at the point yeah. in that success. I don't know, but he's always been there. And he's always, as, as CEO, that's not, a, as you mentioned, Dan, it's not a, a role that, isn't hugely influential of course it is so key decisions one particular that he did get wrong but the rest I don't think we're so far off and again it's not us as fans we look at oh well what players came in or um, what managers came in or what decisions were made on the pitch or whatever and you link that to personal but it's again as, as we've said because Villa are now sort of splitting it business in football we don't even really know what happens on in terms of the business I'm going to guess that it was pretty successful considering how far Villa have come in terms of uh in terms of that side and he definitely played a key role so on that as well standing up for Villa in key meetings over the last five years football's been hugely disrupted by Covid by the Super League debacle and there's a mm. lot more of that sort of stuff to, well hopefully nothing like Covid but there's a lot more sort of pressures going on in football that are going to potentially affect Villa moving forward Perslow is someone you'd want on your side in those meetings yeah, yeah I agree with that those discussions and, and and we did have him which was good again appointing Smith for me that's a huge decision that Villa couldn't really afford to get wrong if that if we, if we made the wrong call there then then you'd be going into another championship season without Grealish and I don't know where mm. we'd be so yeah still there probably decision you could almost weigh up and say Gerard was a bad call but Smith was a good one so it almost balanced itself out ever so slightly just Gerard I think was in the spotlight and his call specifically I think that's again that's obviously going to work against him um but the Villa Park stuff as well that needed a CEO and someone who knows what they're doing to get that off the ground. And by 2025, phase one should be complete, which will be the 50,000 uh, capacity to capacity Villa Park. It was almost his, you know, one of his end goals working for Villa for Perslow was to get Villa Park as a Euro 2028 uh, stadium in terms of the bid. Anyway, we don't know if it's going to be successful yet, mm. but if it is, then Villa Park's there, and that is 
largely down to what Christian Perslow has done. Yeah, Chris Heck is expected to be somebody that is in, in charge of, again, like if we have um, business side and football side, Chris Heck deals with business decisions. So these kind of Premier League meetings, you would expect him to be involved in things like that. Again, kind of speculation at, at this point, and it's, it's a wait and see. The question we had though is, does his lack of experience in English football specifically, does that concern you in any way? It doesn't actually, like not almost in the slightest, because I think in the business side, he has 30 years of experience in sport business, which for me encompasses, do you know what I mean? That's that's all of your basketballs, um, baseball, football, rugby, all of those things. I think if you can work a business, you know you know what you're doing. You're working with um, yeah. know, whatever it might be, sponsors, different things like that, how you're building revenue streams. That's something that he is a uh, expert at. And again, Villa will benefit from it. He, he's not going to interfere with football decisions, which for me would be impacted whether you know uh, a certain yeah. league or you are experience in it and things like that. But the business side, I don't think really um, comes into it. He, I think it was nine years with the 76ers, Philadelphia 76ers. The experience he has and the experience he'll bring, again, over 30 years of it into uh, v Sports or Villa as is working at the moment, that will be a huge benefit to the club moving forward again because they're going for that different approach. It's having that specialism in a certain um, yeah. field, which is what Villa are going with now. So again, something that I think is really exciting. And the club should grow with, say, experts in the sort of specialist uh, field, be it football, be it business. Um, so yeah, a good, um, another good appointment, I think. Let's move away from from Persa and the, and the, the boardroom, I guess, <laughs> to a certain extent. Talk to me about Munchie. A little bit. What's the, what's the kind of latest on that? It's Tuesday afternoon, so bear, bear that in mind. Things change quickly. Villa have been at, at this position previously when they wanted to appoint Alemania as, uh, again, in, in a senior football role. They're basically that same position now with Monchi. <laughs> it's, it, it's very close to getting done. Villa are willing to pay the compensation that is required for them to take Monchi out of Sevilla, Sevilla that you would presume would get over the line. I'll be honest, I'm not too sure what the de- what the final details are, but it seems to be at the end of it now. Again, Villa have been here before, though, so we, you don't want to kind of touch on it too soon, but I'd expect something to happen, not imminently, but very soon, because, as I say, we're kind of at the last knockings of it now. So, yeah, hopefully in the next day, coming days, something will um, break for us. We did a whole show about Alemania when it seemed like that was going to happen and we thought right let's kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit this feels like it will happen at some point who is he what's his track record what does he bring to Villa I didn't want to do that this time because we've kind of been burnt once before yeah, that fine. video did well views wise but effectively wasted our time because it didn't happen in the end so I didn't want to do a whole video about who is Monchi what does he bring what's his track record so can you just do that for me now very quickly yeah, just, yeah. In, just in a little segment just in case not a 30 minute episode just like a couple of minutes kind of summary Where's he been? How long for? Who's he worked with? What's his kind of best transfer? That kind of thing. Yeah, he's a sporting director for Severe for, I think it was about 20 years before he moved mm. on in, I believe it was 2017, to go to Roma. And before then, there was a lot of talk of him being, you know, or, or wanted by basically every top club in Europe because of the level of success he had. He was, he'd sign Rakitic for peanuts and turn him into the player, I say, or, he didn't directly turn him into the player that he is today, but he found Rakitic. Yeah. Uh, other players as well that have all turned um, in sort of global superstars. So went to Roma, but his success quite didn't quite follow there, in all honesty. There was quite a few signings that didn't work, and he's, he's come out in the media and admitted that himself, which I quite like, actually. It's, it's sort of straight talking. If he got something wrong, which he did, um, replacing Rudiger, replacing Salah, he signed quite a few players for big money, and they didn't work so after then he left about I think it was halfway through his four and a half year contract or four year contract that he had with Roma to return to Sevilla and he's been there ever since and again the success hasn't been exactly what it was in the first stint Mm. but you're working with different people it's clubs change as we're going to see with Villa over the next few years very very significantly so working with different people working in different structures potentially as well and it's always about the remit as well. For example, Sevilla, when he was there first time, he was being asked to sort of go for players that were ready to be first team mm. players and ready to perform straight away. Goes to Roma and that uh, sort of operation changed. He was asked to buy players who were going to grow into becoming a Mo Salah or grow into becoming a Tony Rudiger, who they could then sell for, you know, 
millions. That's been something he's asked, been, been asked to do as well for Sevilla uh, this time around. But with Villa, you'd expect it to be a bit of both, but mainly um, for the first team ready here and now because Villa are ready to go. I mean, they're in Europe now, so <laughs> there's no sort of... You don't need to sign 19-year-old to make millions out of them when you can sign a 24-year-old or 26-year-old. Every makes them better and you can always sell them for more anyway. So, yeah, it works both ways. But overall, he's been... Again, it's difficult because he only worked at Sevilla. The first thing was extremely good. Second one was okay. And at Roma, it wasn't great. But I like that Emery knows him and his mm. best three years of his career, Monchi's career, was with working with Emery at Sevilla. And yeah. I think that's the key here. So any director that comes into Villa in terms of this role this is someone that Emery um, knows and knows he can work with. That's the key thing. So, yeah, I'm excited by it. And again, the proof will be in the pudding, but it's something that, um, that I get behind. And the things that I've read about Munchie, and again, I've not done heaps and heaps of research and certainly not as much as you will have because of, we've had our fingers burnt before, let's kind of, you know, wait and see. He seems to share similar personality traits to Emery as well. That he has this kind of obsessive nature to wanting to improve and, and do good things. And yeah, like you say there about Munchie's best time in his career was with Unai Emery. That's very exciting, isn't it? Because Unai Emery, is, it's, it feels like on the verge of something here. So there's a couple of comments come through on Facebook while, while we're here that we'll, we'll go through as well. So I've only got a couple left on the ones we spoke about before. Put you on the spot here big time from James. Okay. Who do you think will be our next signing? A 16-year-old from West Brom. Uh, <laughs> England international uh, as reported by <laughs> no, we won't, uh, that is I, I forget the, uh, the chap's name but yeah th- that's a bit of news um, I mean we don't know um, is it honest <laughs> we don't know I mean, no one knows do they I think- you know what's interesting about that, and this is why I wanted to bring it up, really? Yeah. Uh, over the last probably five years, Villa have been very quiet with transfers. I think Perslow is a key part of that, of, of kind of keeping the media and the overall kind of narrative away from what Villa are doing internally, that we kind of go about our business and it's like, here's a signing, see you later. Like we do it on our terms. It doesn't kind of, there's no leaks or anything like that, generally speaking. I do wonder whether that will continue under like a new regime just because I think Pozo would have been a key part of that so we yeah. might start to see more links and stuff and more kind of like we've seen a lot of Spanish media specifically this this transfer window kind of getting involved in linking us with loads of players kind of people saying oh using us for, for agents and all that kind of stuff is, is whatever you might see more stuff like that going forward now than you did over the last couple of years yeah hopefully I mean I think that'll benefit us so that would go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we, we just don't know who's going to be next through the door. We know what positions Emery wants to Emery wants to improve on and we have um, some of his targets. But again, we're not privy to a list of players. No, um, it's a wait and see game sort of thing. But I mean, we, we reported last week about Tielemans being um, that decision basically inbound and then Saturday signs and mm-hmm. Monch as well we had. So hopefully we can, as as and when developments happen, we'll be, we'll be there and you'll hear about it and read about it on Birmingham Live. In, in terms of numbers then, uh, the, again, I think the video we did last week when we spoke about Tielem and you said that Villa don't need to do major surgery to their squad. If you had to just quickly put a number on how many signings do you think we'll make, what would you go yeah, for? I'd say about six. Do you want me are, you to, give, are you going to give me any further elaboration on that? Are they all like starters or is it squad players? Or I think they're all, everyone's a squad player. You have to get into the first eleven, don't you? I think especially with Emery because, I mean, there's certain players who you, you would class as maybe... Um, not undroppable, but key to the way we play. For example, McGinn, captain, and seems to set the tempo in most games. But then, where do you fit Yuri Tulemans in when Jacob Ramsey, Douglas Louise, and Kamara all fit? So, no player for me is a starting player anymore. It's all competition replaced, and that's the way it has to be if you're a club trying to push into the top four, really. But it's, it's about having different options, different um, solutions, should we say, for different problems that different teams pose in Europe, in cup competitions, in the Premier League. Because Villa want to play on all fronts next year. Sorry, compete on all fronts. So go far in the Conference League, try and win it without that being a deficit of the Premier League campaign. And yeah. Caroline League Cup, for me, a huge opportunity for Villa next year. I know we're playing in Europe, but if you get a nice draw, something like Stevenage at home, <laughs> um, a nice run of games, should we say, Villa can go to Wembley. And with mm-hmm. the team that we have, and that Emery was a cup specialist, should we say? Then I'd back us to, to lift silverware, and I mean, whatever happens if we lift silverware next year, that's that's a good season. Yeah, the Conference League as well. I saw West Ham's like run to the yeah. final, and you, you looked yeah. at that like the club badges, and it's like pff, didn't play anyone. Yeah, I don't think it'll be that straightforward. Um, <laughs> and I know I've said my piece about Conference League before, and again, I don't want it to get out of context with that. But you can't tell me that Villa aren't one of the favourites to win it 
I know Juventus and uh, or the Juventus should be in there. Eintracht Frankfurt as well. Frankfurt, sorry, will be a good, um, a very good test. You know, I mean, they'll be the favourites with Villa and Lille as well as well yeah. are there. I mean, no, no team will be easy, but ultimately, if you go, if you go through it. Villa should be going um, all the way as long as they don't get picked out against one of the top teams in the round of 16 or quarterfinals or whatever. Yeah, this is why I'm not that bothered about seeded or unseeded or the playoff game because if we're backing Villa to be one of the favourites to win the whole tournament, like, come on, doesn't matter what we do, does it? Doesn't matter who we play. It doesn't, but while there's not much going on in terms of, I mean, there is actually a lot going on. But, <laughs> exactly. but while we while we can kind of think about it, I'd much rather Villa be seeded because there's just an option you get Juventus and that is much harder than playing Spartak Trinova, however. <laughs> Let's talk about the midfield three very quickly. Another question we had in sent uh, on, on Twitter, I think, asking about Tiedemans and his his role in the side. And me and Jordan Blackwell, our Leicester City reporter, did a video yesterday. Uh, and one of the questions in that was asking whether he could play like a, a the wide role in Villa's system, the McGinn or the Ramsey role. And he didn't think he had the physicality to do that. So he's going to be playing centrally. And Douglas Louis, you said earlier that no one's guaranteed to start. I think if they're fit, Douglas Louis and Kamara are the two that start in midfield. So that leaves Tielemans with a, a bench position or playing the number 10 second striker role, which is not impossible, but I don't see it. Do we possibly change the system entirely and have a three midfield of Tielemans, Louis, Kamara? Or do you just think, again, it's a bit of a Emery knows and we'll find out in six weeks or so? Emery knows and we'll find out in six weeks. I don't I say that. I don't think anyone knows what Emery's gonna come out with in the first game or then the second game or the third like I just think mm. it's a different to different different systems, different solutions for each opponent. Given we play on Thursday, then Sunday, if we play the same way with the same players every week, we're gonna get found out like West Ham after mm. so yeah. I know there was conference league, but that's different. So yeah, I, and yeah, it's difficult because Villa did play, apart from Bailey and Buendir, pretty much the same 11, give or take a couple of injuries to Kamara here and there or whatever. Emery has proven that he can do it with the same group of players, but I don't think he'd, he enjoys that. I think he wants options and he wants to pick different players. So we could see Tielemans line up in a two and put Douglas Louise maybe higher. Ramsey comes off the bench. I don't know. I have no idea. And no one will up until the first kick of the first game. Mm. Maybe pre-season will give us a little clue to that as well. But I think it's having those positions, uh, sorry, depth in those positions, is that's the key thing. And I mean, for me, for the Villa fans, we're going to have to get used to having a squad of, of players who any other club would probably take. You know, teams yeah, yeah. would place on a bench of any other club in the Premier League. Mm. So we've got to kind of get used to that. And I remember years ago looking at Tottenham's team and Everton's team and thinking, oh, wow, like, look at their bench. That, you know, that, that gets in Villa's team every day of the week so or how do you manage that squad but now that's what Emery's going to have to do with Villa and we're going to be signing some very exciting players this summer and players who Emery knows he can trust to improve yeah. the team with so I don't know how this exactly how the team's going to look on the first day but it will be um, it will be an improvement on the one that ended it and ended it in seventh place so yeah it's exciting the final question that we've been sent in again features heavily on the hypothetical and the last few answers have been let's just wait and see and I'm not going to accept that answer from you for this one the final question is where do you think Villa will be in the next five years uh, we would have won at least one trophy by then yeah oh. defo I think we'll win a trophy this time next year <laughs> never mind yeah. five years I don't know I, I mean the obvious thing is the Champions League I don't know if in five years we'll be I say ready we, we probably will be ready to compete but you just don't know. As long as Villa are in and around it, I'm a happy man. You know, we yeah. can't be uh, guarded by anything else. Let's try and compete for those top four positions in the next five years and see where it takes us. If we get it one year, that might be the platform Villa need to sustain it for years to come, as I say, like Tottenham have managed to do. So that's the sort of thing we need to be doing. I think uh, sustaining our success for as many years as we possibly can. Quick fire ones then for the five years. We said we'll win one trophy in that time. What trophy will it be? I said at least one, to be fair. Okay, yeah, that's fair, yeah. I think we'll win one Carabao Cup, at least one Carabao Cup. I can see us winning, obviously, the Conference League. Mm. I'd go with those two for now. I don't want to get too greedy because if I start saying... Two, yeah, two trophies in five years would be more than we used to. Exactly. We haven't won a lot for a long time we can't now be saying we're going to win four things in four years so mm. conference league in the Carabao Cup in the next few years I think would be great that'll do for this episode of Clout and Blue we'll be back uh, later this week uh, me and Matt are doing a video like a keep sell loan kind of thing looking through the um, the whole Aston Villa squad list at the moment stay tuned to Clout and Blue for your uh, four things Aston Villa thanks John for your time as always and uh, we'll see you again very soon